I'm preaching this morning on faith. And when this subject came to me, I thought, oh, cool, I can do that. <laughs> I tell you, I have been trying to wrap my arms around this subject for all week long. And it has been a chore. But it also has been a growing experience. So bear with me this morning, church. Faith. This is a big word in the Christian community. We are commanded to live by faith. We pray in faith. We live in faith. We grow in faith. We trust in faith. And we hope in faith. The prophet Habakkuk begins his book by questioning God about the seemingly seemingly lawlessness of the world. The powerful crush the helpless and seem to flourish in their wickedness. Habakkuk stated his case and waited for an answer. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. The Lord's answer is instructive. The solution for all the world's problems is for a time determined by God and in a way that is designed by God. What the prophet sees at present doesn't make sense but it is part of a progressive plan that will manifest, manifest itself in its time. God states that the just will live by his faith. There is that word, faith. So what is faith? Where does it come from? And what does it do for us? So bear with me. We're going to do some word studies. The word occurs 245 times in the King James Version. Interesting, only two times in the Old Testament and the rest in the New Testament. The Hebrew word amun is translated as faithful, truth, or faith. The Greek word pistis translates as faith, assurance, believe, belief, them that believe, or fidelity. And we go to Easton's Bible Dictionary, and it says, quote, faith is the general persuasion of the mind that a certain statement is true. Its primary idea is trust. A thing is true and therefore worthy of trust. It admits of many degrees up to the full assurance of faith in accordance with the evidence on which it rests. Faith is the result of teaching. Go to Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings 
of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The Bible dictionary goes on. Knowledge is an essential element in all faith and is sometimes spoken of as an equivalent to faith. Yet the two are distinguished in this respect, that faith includes in it assent, which is an act of the will in addition to the act of understanding. Assent to the truth is of the essence of faith. And the ultimate ground on which our assent to any revealed truth rests is the veracity of God, end quote. So to summarize, we can trust something if it is true. And the truth relies on evidence. Romans says that we come to faith by hearing the word of God. The hearing of the word gives us knowledge, which we need. But even more, faith comes by believing the one from whom the, tr whom the truth comes. I believe that the more you know God, the deeper and tighter your relationship is with the Almighty. The deeper and tighter is your faith. You can't believe in what you don't know. We go on to the International Standard Bible Dictionary, and it states that there are two senses of the word, the active and the passive. The active sense occurs in the majority of its use, the meaning being faith or trust. The use in the passive sense means fidelity, or trustworthiness. This source also goes on to discuss Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The same source goes on to state, quote, It is important to notice that Hebrews 11.1 1 is no exception to the rule that faith normally means reliance or trust. Their faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is sometimes interpreted as if faith, in the writer's view, were, so to speak, a faculty of second sight, a mysterious intuition into the spiritual world. But the chapter amply shows that the faith illustrated, e.g. by Abraham, Moses, Rahab, was simply reliance on a God known to be trustworthy. Such a reliance enabled the believer to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. In short, the phrase here, faith is the evidence, etc., is parallel in form to our familiar saying, knowledge is power. End quote. <laughs> I hope you followed that. Faith is not some mysterious, mystical thing. Faith in God is not blind. We have faith in God because he has shown himself and this, and has, he's shown himself and has proven himself to be trustworthy. Faith opens the doors to the gifts of God for us, and the gifts of God through faith are forgiveness, healing, redemption, 
justification, purification, peace, and eternal life. Vine's expository dictionary states that, quote, faith primarily is a firm persuasion, a conviction based on hearing. The object of Abraham's faith was not God's promise. His faith rested on God himself, end quote. Remember that Abraham believed God, and through that belief came his righteousness. Remember, saints, to remain focused not on the promises, but on the guarantor of the promises, God himself. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul here echoes our earlier examination of faith. It is not mysterious or mystical. It comes from the Spirit and dwells in our hearts. It is faith that opens up the mysteries of the heavens and helps us to understand the love of God. And I will confess that the further I get into faith and knowledge, the more I realize how much more there is and how much I just don't know. The more I get to know about the Lord, the more I get to know Him, the bigger He gets. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Faith is what keeps us going forward. Psalm 42, verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him the help of my countenance and my God. The psalmist knows <clears throat> where his strength is because he has relied upon him before and can trust him to be there in his present situation. We can have faith because God is faithful. I became acquainted with a traveling evangelist at my former church in California. Ray Brooks is a French Canadian, <clears throat> and he met with churches all around the U.S., all around Canada, and he w even went to, he had churches in France that he would visit. He is a man who lives by faith, and he had many compelling stories about the work of faith in his own life. He had this to say in one of his newsletters that I found remarkable, so I copied it and I kept it. Quote, living by faith is somewhat risky because you are never sure you are doing the right thing until you see it happen and have the evidence. Faith is not reasonable. Reason is safe. Faith is not. Second Corinthians verse, chapter 5, verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Hope is in the future. Faith is in the now. End quote. An interesting observation by a very interesting man. 
So I hope I have given us a working definition of what faith is. Now, let's have a look at where it comes from. <clears throat> Excuse me. Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Paul is saying that faith comes through the Holy Spirit. Our works don't produce faith. Our works are a product of that faith. And remember, faith working without love is worthless. Faith is not doing, it is being. And if we don't have love for the object of our faith, the faith is meaningless. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We, the children of wrath, were made alive by the grace of God. Through his grace we were saved and were given the faith that enabled us to believe what a marvelous thing that is, loved ones. It doesn't depend on us. It's all from Him. And from this faith will come good works that He has already prepared for us. We all know the story of Jesus walking upon the sea. And then Peter seeing that it was the Lord, asked Jesus if he could join him. <clears throat> this was probably my favorite Bible story when I was a young boy. I mean, how cool would it be <clears throat> to walk on the water? It really fired up my imagination. And I'm sure it captured the attention of the disciples when it occurred. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 14 Verses 25 through 31. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? <clears throat> when Peter stepped <clears throat> out of the boat, he had his eyes and his attention right on the Lord. 
He walked on the water because he was focused on Jesus. But what happened to our intrepid disciple? He looked away and he started focusing on his circumstances and was overcome by the sight and the sound of the wind and the waves. His faith left him when Jesus was no longer his focus. The way of the world became his focus, and he started sinking. Church, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus in order to keep our faith. After all, he is the author and perfecter of our faith. Stay focused on the source. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Now it happened on a certain day <clears throat> that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to him, Where is your faith? This is another account of Jesus and his disciples being out on a boat <clears throat> in a storm. Jesus is sleeping, the wind is raging, and the boat is filling up with water. <clears throat> the disciples wake Jesus and cry out to him in their panic. Jesus calls on the winds to cease, and immediately there is calm. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and asks, Where is your faith? Where is our faith when we are in the middle of a storm? Can we truly trust the one who has promised to never leave us or forsake us? Reflect on the number of times that God has rescued you from a storm in your life, Christian. <clears throat> the very act of the redemption of our souls demonstrates his commitment to each one of us. He didn't save us from one calamity in order for us to be consumed by another. God is faithful, and in his faithfulness, we derive our own faith. Faith from the faithful one. Romans <clears throat> chapter 1 verses 5 through 6. <clears throat> through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Christ. <clears throat> Here again, scripture states that faith proceeds to us from God through his great grace. We are also reminded that he called us. We didn't come to him of our own volition. That faith, excuse me, the faith that proceeds from us did not originate in us. It comes from the grace of God. Romans chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. <clears throat> he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness." God told Abraham that he and Sarah 
would be parents to an heir. Sarah was 90, and Abraham was around 100. Abraham was said to be strengthened by faith, that he was sure that God could do what he said. And the strengthening came from God, not Abraham. His righteousness came from faith, and the faith came from God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I plucked this verse out of the middle of a discourse about the nation of Israel being rejected by the gospel, but I think the context stays intact for the purposes of this discussion. Faith doesn't come out of the void. We hear a message, but not just any message. The message is the word of God. And the word, the truth of the word pierces our souls and testifies to our spirit the veracity of the gospel. Scripture is what awakens our souls and opens us up to faith in the one who is trustworthy. Now, we have somewhat defined faith, and we know that it comes from God. Now, what does faith do for us? Consider the centurion whose servant was paralyzed. He pleaded with Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus said that he would come and heal him. And the centurion replied by saying that there was no need for Jesus to come to his house. All he had to do was speak a word, and it would be done. The scripture says that Jesus marveled at the man's faith. But I think the marveling was for the rest of the crowd. Jesus knew where the man's faith came from. Let us all pray for the faith of the centurion, that we would be able to take God at his word and believe. How about the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years? Her whole focus was only to simply touch his garment. She knew this would make her well. As Ray Brooks said, this was not a reasonable act. It was an act of faith prompted by the Spirit of God. Remember the two blind men that Jesus called out. The two mind. Remember the two blind men that called out to Jesus as he passed by to have mercy on him. Jesus asked them if they believed that he was able to heal, and they answered in the affirmative. Jesus then healed them, saying it was being done according to their faith. Now we know that not every request for healing or for anything else is granted. And it is not because of the person asking lacks faith. God is the sovereign. We are not. He sees the whole picture. We don't. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. But true faith resides in the place where we trust that God will always do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. That is the place where we need to live. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with you, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. <laughs> this is a passage that I have read and pondered over the years, but it wasn't until I was prepping for this sermon 
that I caught on to the shield of faith. The scripture says, above all, take the shield of faith. It's that important. We don't dare venture out into the world without faith. <laughs> the devil will have us so full of darts so quickly that it would be over before we ever got started. Faith is what protects us from the lies of the enemy and inoculates us against the passions of our flesh. So, to paraphrase an old American Express commercial, faith, don't leave home without it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called in the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We are called into faith by the God who is faithful. And through that faith, we are able to enter into fellowship with our Savior. And Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I know I'm not the only one in this room who wants to be able to say this at the end of my earthly sojourn. Faith is what will get us there. And thank the Lord, my faith does not depend on me. He will get us there because he is the one who is faithful. I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. The whole of Hebrews chapter 11 has to do with the faith of some Old Testament saints. I would encourage you to read it on your own to get a more complete take on the subject of faith. But I'm going to try and break down the first three verses again. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Faith and hope go together. The evidence of things not seen is our belief in the things that God has promised that he will do. They are the not yet but the will be. The elders, Abraham, Moses, Samuel, and the rest of the prophets gained approval because they believed God, not by hard evidence, but by faith. In verse 3, the writer refers to the creation of the universe. The word of God is what created it, and not out of pre-existent matter, but out of nothing. This explanation actually makes more sense than anything else that is out there. And it comes by our faith in the word of God. And finally, Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We wait patiently. We keep the commandments, and our faith is what sees us through to the end. Biff, please hand out the elements. <clears throat> I'll close with Romans chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 5 through 8. But to him who does not work, but believes on him 
who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin.